Well, all right. Welcome, good people. This is Meet the Candidates 2022, and we really appreciate you stopping by to check this out. We're looking to interview as many of the candidates that are going to be on your November ballot as possible. So if there's someone you'd like to see on the show, make sure you give us a call, 810-239-2901, and we'll reach out to them and see if they want to participate in this year's Meet the Candidates. It's a full ballot this year, and there's a lot of things that you might need to know. So stick around, stick, stay tuned. Is that what it is? Stay tuned or, or, or hit subscribe and notified so you'll know when we're back up with the next interviews. This evening, I have a special guest. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yay! And it's Emily, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, Emily Dorr. That's correct. I got it right. You know, I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> Emily, wow. I understand you're running for the Flint School Board. So my that first question to you is not going to be tell me a little bit about yourself. My first question to you is going to be why? Well... There's many reasons, but I will be succinct in the interest of time. The reason I want to serve on the Flint School Board is because I believe that Flint kids deserve better than what they are getting right now. And I believe the Flint community believe, uh, deserves better than what it's getting right now. And leadership matters. I've served in many leadership roles across the state uh, the last 15 years, doing various community economic development, housing development, property redevelopment, different jobs. And this kind of work, I think, would be an asset for the school board to have as one of seven members. And I've served on many nonprofit boards as well as a school board and believe that respectful, civil, organized leadership is how you can help move a district forward. Not a bad answer. I'm not going to say you're wrong. <laughs> But now I am going to revert to that original question. So I want you to tell me, first of all, about where you grew up. Where did you grow up? Well, my twin brother and I were the first twins born at Hurley Hospital in 1985. And we lived on Atherton Road. My mom works for, worked for Ubum Flint. And my dad was a teacher out in Goodrich. And... We lived on Atherton Road until I was seven and then okay. moved out to Goodrich. I went to the school district that my dad taught at. So I definitely admit to not going to Flint schools and admit that, you know, the, the growing up phase was my Flint years when I was young and then Goodrich when I was, um, you know, wait, seven wait, and up. But you're, you're 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 ignoring the important part. Did your mother win anything for you guys being the first twins of the year? Well, I think that she was. Um, she should have just won an award because she carried two seven pound twins full term. Wow! wow. So she definitely should have just won an award in general. <laughs> Let's talk about going, let's talk about schooling in Goodrich. What was that like for you? The, the elementary schools and the middle schools, what, what was that like for you? I think it was very good quality. It was not diverse. And that was always uh, something that I knew from my preschool and kindergarten uh, that was a diverse Montessori school mm -hmm. where that we went to. I knew that that was frankly lacking. Uh -huh. But in terms of the quality of education, it was it was definitely good. It was 
I was surrounded by kids that came to school wanting to learn and teachers that were supported to teach through a positive environment in the school and administrators that were able to move a strategic vision forward for improvement and do the work that teachers need to improve their skills and then create the facilities that made all of us students have a good place to go to school. It, it was good, but I think it had its drawbacks, again, being very not diverse. And I also think I had a different experience being a teacher's kid because I was very plugged in. I had a built-in tutor and was able to always know what was going on. So there was no disconnect between my parents and the school. And I think that that's a huge thing in the Flint schools right now. I, I feel like we have to rebuild trust with the parents of Flint. Yeah. Okay. I, I was going to ask you more or less, did you trade your peanut butter and jelly sandwich for bologna or for your bolognese for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? I had the peanut butter and jelly. My brother had the bologna. And <laughs> just, I think we just ate our sandwiches and got out, out to the playground as quickly as possible. Okay. Now, listen, as a school, you can have to school me because I'm really not sure what you do as a school board member. I mean, do you pay the janitor? Do you buy the trucks? Do you put gas in the school buses? What, what do you do? School board members are a governance body. They are not an operations body. So they oversee the strategic vision of the school district. They make sure that there is a budget passed every year. They are responsible for looking at the metrics by which the school district is measured and determining what needs to be funded in the budget to help improve those metrics. They are responsible for driving the superintendent to implement the vision and oversee the operations. So they are a governance board. They are not an operational board. Okay, so now do you, okay, so I mean, how often can you change the vision of the the school district? Is it like every election cycle when when new people are elected, the the direction changes, or is there some kind of commitment to the to the route it's taken? My understanding is that the school board just approved a five year strategic plan at the June uh, board meeting just okay. a few months ago. Uh -huh. And so that was a five-year plan. Uh, that's pretty standard across public sector organizations. Our five-year plans that set a strategy and you have an org organizational or operational plan each year that is building toward that five-year strategic vision. And in terms of what the Michigan Department of Education requires, they, I think, have flexibility when it comes to like updates to a strategic plan. Um, I think they are more interested in the test scores that they see as metrics. Okay, because I mean, my basic understanding is, is 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 we get our marching orders from the state, right? They tell us what we have to teach the kids and how you have to teach the kids, and by what point the kids have to have it, correct? So I would say they do govern the curriculum when it comes to what credits you need to graduate. Mm -hmm. They do not dictate which reading tactics you use or which math curriculum or exactly how long, if you have class long classes that are 55 minutes long or, um, you block scheduling that is 90 minutes long, and then you switch classes halfway through the year. So you get eight classes. So if you do four, that's block scheduling versus you do five 55-minute classes. And so you only have seven classes. 
that's an example of a school district being able to decide what they want to do. I had block scheduling when I was in high school. So I had 32 classes over the course of my high school instead of only 28. But our school day was a few minutes longer to make sure that you had enough instructional time to have the full uh, curriculum taught in 90 minute blocks for half the year. So again, those kinds of decisions are made by the superintendent and the resources that are needed to implement are to be approved by the board. Okay. So I was reading that getting kids up at 6 a.m. in the morning to go to school at 7 a.m. to start class at 7.30 is a big mistake that there's no reason for these kids to have to be to school at seven in the morning when it would be more beneficial to their anatomy, their growing, and their their need for sleep for school to start at like 10, 1030. Have you heard that? Yes. I colloquially understand that the schedule of school is based on the agricultural cycle that they would start kids as early as possible so they could get home as early as possible and get out working on the farm. And that was reality for my dad. Okay. My dad and his 10 siblings grew up on a farm and that was absolutely reality. <laughs> they were out milking cows at 5 a.m. and at school by 7.30 and back working on the farm by 3 or 3.30. And I think that as we've moved away from having uh, a predominant agricultural uh, workforce to having more industrial, I think you have more people than who consider what makes sense for the children to be in school when parents are at work. And so I think that that definitely governs now the typical workday of nine to five, then that means schools look at that. Although I would argue school days end earlier than 5 p.m., although there's many extracurriculars after. But anyway, so I have heard what you're saying, and I, I feel like that's the kind of thing that should be looked at. And if there is research that needs to be done, I Although I don't think that that's like a, something that would necessarily be researched at our school. There could be a pilot, perhaps, that is at one school versus another. I think you also can ask the parents. I think you need to trust parents and you need to trust teachers. If teachers know that kids are not doing well in first hour because it's so early, the teachers will know. So I do think that you can do some... Uh, more informal interviews with parents and teachers, look at research done by education experts across the country. We have an education uh, expert team actually here in Flint, the Mott Foundation. It's one of the uh, kind of preeminent funders of education policy across the country. And I would love to know some of their recommendations uh, separate from everything else that people look at from the Mott Foundation as a funding source, I think that they definitely can be a policy source. Um, so anyway, I, it's a good question. I think that it merits looking into if the kids are struggling in first hour or okay. if they're you know tired by the, by the last hour. I mean, we do need to make sure that kids are frankly le learning as much as they can when they are in the school building. Tell me again about your vision for the Flint schools. How are you going to, what are you going to do? And how, I don't want to say how are you going to do it, but what's your vision? I know that there's a lot of things probably bouncing around on your plate. And and if you had to pick the, 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 the jewels, what are the things that you'd like to see change in, in the Flint school system? I am running for a six-year term, and 
the way I operationally look at that is that the first two years are about stabilization. We need to stabilize the students that are in Flint schools. We need to make sure that they their parents continue to choose to send them there. And to me, that is looking at facilities. So facilities are top of mind for me, both planning to build new schools and making sure that the schools in use now are maintained for the health of the children, both physical and mental. And then I also feel as part of that, it's absolutely imperative that the blight is handled when it comes to all of the school buildings that have been left vacant and have not been maintained or ha had a plan for them. But yeah, I, I think stabilization around the facilities and then stabilization around the teachers, making sure that we are making it an environment where people want to teach there and they are supported and they are developed professionally to continue to learn tactics that will reach our students. So that's years one and two. And then I think years three and four could be more looking at that where kind of the, that growth could start to come in. Although I, I don't think we're going to grow without new schools. I think we absolutely have to have new school buildings. I think that parents, if you look at the way that they were so interested in the Flint Cultural Center Academy without even really asking a lot of questions about what curriculums were there, they liked the new school. Yeah. All right. 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 <laughs> so I think the school buildings are crucial uh, for growth. And so that's years three and four. And then years five and six, I think, are then being able to really set the path for, um, you know, kind of long term uh, sustainability around where the, the, the new trajectory is. And I say new because the things I'm saying are not currently happening. And I, I believe that we can do it. We just need to have leadership that wants to work together and stay focused and keep the main thing, the main thing. And that's kids. You know, I am all for uh, new facilities. I have always thought that the um, the way we do it is kind of backwards, you know. Um, we need to uh, find a spot, and I thought the old Buick uh, City location would be good, right off 475, where we can put up three towers. One is the high school, one is the middle school, and one is the elementary school. And they all share a campus. You know, where there's a soccer field, a swimming uh, field, a basketball, tennis, the whole nine yards, and it's all a big old campus. I thought we should have done that years ago. Are you, are you, you on my side? The way you said three towers made me think of Lord of the Rings. So I just giggled a little bit. Holy <laughs> <laughs> like, precious. Like Gandalf on the top. <laughs> Mies want to go to school in Flint, we do. <laughs> Sorry, when you said towers, it threw me off. No, I um, want you thinking of Smeagol. Um, yeah. <laughs> and maybe so, they're not towers, but I mean, enough to accommodate growth is what I'm thinking. You know what I mean? So I am not a, an expert on school design. I, I don't think that the board needs to be. The board needs to be willing to be organized and plan to have the resources to hire experts. And the superintendent then is enabled to work with those experts and move things forward. So I'm not an expert on school design. I do think that we have to design for safety. And that safety of kids getting in and out of the building with traffic. Um, I, of course, think that we need to keep busing kids, but with a lot of parents doing their own drop-off and, and pick up, that needs to be safe. 
um, it, there needs to be safety when they are in the school. And obviously there's been a lot of concern around school shootings. And so I think that there's an opportunity with how we build new schools that increases that um, based on research um, and how design impacts that. And then I think that there's a lot of opportunity for how we pick location around schools to be based on data. I think that it makes sense to look at where students live and look at the students currently going to Flint schools, looking at look at students live in Flint who don't go to Flint schools and use heat maps and other data to make a decision about where schools are put. And that's not something I'm going to comment on now because I don't have that data in front of me. Um, but I do think it makes sense around like sharing certain campus assets. I, I, I love the idea that that there would be opportunities for every kid in Flint to be able to take swim lessons at a school. I love that. I think that there should be access to sports and, and you could uh, be able to do that at school. I love Ima that. Imagine this, Emily, a metro station underneath the school that has a line that goes north and south and east and west. Listen, I love transit. I I don't know that we are uh, going to convince the city of Flint to use infrastructure dollars on that kind of investment, but you can do a lot with um, regular running buses. I, I do, <laughs> if you live in Chicago, you use the bus. Uh, mm -hmm. If you live in New York City, you use the bus. You're um, no fun, Emily. I want a monorail. I want a monorail going through the city of Flint. North, south, east, and west. You got to get with me here. Is it like elevated, like the people elevated. mover? Elevated, yes, yes. <laughs> Just for the kids. So it can be small. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we got a couple minutes left. I really want you to look at the camera, get close, and, and, and tell me why I should vote for you. Okay. There are 15 candidates on the ballot and I am very proud to be a part of a slate of five that are working together as a team in our campaign. And the other four members are uh, Dylan Luna, Melody Relaford, Michael Clack, Tere King, and Emily Dorr. So the five of us have been working together since July, and we are showing voters that we can work together as a team, we can maintain respect and civility, and that's really important to rebuild trust with the parents and with the community. And I think that I would ask voters to vote for the five of us because that would allow for a fresh start in terms of the five of us never having been on the school board before. Obviously there are two members that their terms are still going and so they would remain on the board. But I would ask that voters see that our teamwork now is indicative of our teamwork when we are on the board and that's huge. Uh, next, I would ask voters to vote for me given the professional acumen I would bring to the board around real estate and property redevelopment, as well as my experience serving on a school board and various nonprofit boards, as well as my leadership experience in various levels of state government. Okay. Um, I am somebody that is genuine and I'm going to talk and and listen and really absorb what people are saying. I don't think that that changes once I get elected. I definitely want there to be a better connection to rebuild that trust with parents and rebuild the trust with the community. And I'm committed to doing just that. 
Um, I think the other important piece of this is I'm not here to um, have some agenda. I don't have kids. So that's the thing. I don't have children in Flint schools. I, I don't have an agenda for any certain thing because of an experience that my kids had that that's not me. I'm here because I moved back to Flint in 2016 to work at City Hall during the water crisis and manage millions of dollars of grants responsibly. And I am not going anywhere. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I believe that we can improve. I have faith and I guess I want voters to have hope when they think about voting for me and think about voting for the slate. All right. Great, Emily. Well, listen, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on Meet the Candidates. I hope it's beneficial to your campaign. I'm going to encourage those of you that are watching, if you have someone that you would like to see on Meet the Candidates, make sure you give us a call, 810-239-2901. That's 810-239-2901. Two nine zero one, and we'll see if we can't get them on. Remember, this is Meet the Candidates Spectacle Production, sponsored, and we are determined to make a difference. But we need you to, too. As always, there'll be more after this. You're really not that talented. You're not attractive. Too fat. You're too short. Too old. Why don't you just give up? Give up. Give up. Just give up. Isn't your dad supposed to be here? He's coming. He promised. <laughs> I trust him. Showtime, guys. One minute. 